sing all three verses. God bless you, Brother Terry. I think he has looked at the message for tonight and picking out that song, which I think is very, very appropriate. So, we're in the series, Judges, the Record of Israel's National Failure. And we're in Lesson 14, Gideon and the Trappings of Success. Um, I think Gideon is the sixth judge that we've, we've, that's been introduced uh, it's amazing, uh, at the very last verse, I think it is chapter 3, Shamgar is uh, what was one of the judges, is given one verse, one verse. So Gideon, and we'll find out as well, Solomon, uh, not Samson, uh, gets the lion's share of words uh, in uh, chapters in the book of Judges. So this is Judges chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, and, and, and uh, we're looking at, as it were, the last chapter of Gideon's judgeship and story. It's been an interesting journey, a lot to learn. Robert Mugabe, the uh, former freedom fighter turned ruthless autocrat who ruled the country of Zimbabwe for 37 years, died last Friday at the age of 95. Uh, he came to power uh, promising prosperity and democracy. He left behind 
a nation, a country that continues to struggle with massive debts, a worthless currency, and an impoverished population, all because he became infatuated with his own sense of importance and success. And uh, Mugabe traded a mantle of a liberator for the mantle of a tyrant. And uh, sad to say, that, that scenario was repeated time and time again in, in our world. Al uh, Bernstein, an American sports writer, once made the comment that nothing conceits like success. And so Gideon's really made a journey. I mean, back in chapter 7, verse 15, you remember uh, he was really lacking that assurance. He was lacking that confidence. And God was so, you know, he put up with the fleece thing and, you know, and gave him one more. He needed it again. I need another hit of, of confidence. So, okay, you take someone, you go down to the midnight camp, and you'll hear over hear a conversation. And that'll help you. Well, he did. And there's two of the uh, soldiers there, one was telling another this dream that he had. You ever have those conversations, you know? Can't believe the dream I had last night. So he talked about this gigantic barley loaf that rolled over the uh, Midianite, the enemy camp, right? And, uh, and when, and he says, you know who that, you know, that was Gideon. That was Gideon. Well, you know what it says? That when Gideon heard that, he worshiped the Lord. He worshiped the Lord. Gideon knew his own weakness. He understood that uh, victory must come from the Lord. And sad to say, in the closing chapters here of Gideon's life, we find him worshiping uh, at the altar of his own success with uh, all, of its, all of its trappings. That word trappings, it speaks of all the things, and we're going to look at those here in this passage, all the things that uh, give you the outward appearance of success. And I'm talking things like wealth and fame and power. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said success has ruined many a man. And so the moment you believe in your own greatness is the moment Success turns to failure. And so you can ask Gideon, sad to say. We're in verse 22. Let's begin. Judges 8, 22. And the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, because, hey, Gideon, you've delivered us from the hand of Midian. And so in the aftermath of this great victory uh, over the Midianites, we find here that the men of Israel offer Gideon the opportunity to rule over them. And for a long time, uh, the people, the tribes of Israel had been plagued by heathen kings and nations, you know. And uh, it seemed uh, natural that this great victory over the Midianites would begin to give rise to their desire uh, for a king to rule the nations. You know, these, um, the Midianites, uh, you know, also with the children of these, what are, they, were, they were nomads. They were like locusts, you know, and they would just, they didn't come in and occupy, they would just wait until you were harvesting, and, and then they would come in and, and pillage. And they were beginning to see the advantage of having central, strong leader that would uh, save them from their enemies. And so what better candidate, right, uh, than for a king than Gideon? I mean, he is God's um, man, mighty man of valor. And so the offer of kingship is made to him. It's first, it's personal. We want you to rule over us. But then it goes beyond that. It's also dynastic. We talked about the uh, Davidic covenant. You know, David wanted to build a house for God. God said, no, but I will build a house for you. And the house that God had in mind was a dynastic house. He said, uh, so it, it was not only personal, but he says, You're both thou, thy son, thy son's son also. 
And so the whole family, you know, perks up with this. And, and the offer presented uh, here is a kingship. Now think about this. A kingship that is not just a kingship. I know they're later going to have a king. But it, it's a man-appointed king versus a God-anointed king. You understand? God-anointed and appointed I've heard churches say, we need a new pastor and we need a young man. Well, how do you know? Or we need this and we need that. Well, how do you know? i tell you what you need. You need the person that God has in mind. That's what you need. Well, the underlying motive for all of this is the presumption made by the men of Israel that it was Gideon who delivered them. And they said to Gideon, for thou hast delivered us. Boy, what a heady thing to be said, you know, to you. Well, there's a clear absence. And I think we, we need to take note what is already missing. I mean, we just had victory. They're going to have 40 years of peace by the time this chapter ends. But already there's something absent here. And that is absent is the praise and the glory uh, that is due and directed toward God by the children of Israel. It's just... It's just gone. Their knowledge, their allegiance toward the Lord God of Israel has already been lost. Instead, they, are, they credited Gideon more with the victory uh, than, than with God, than giving God credit or glory. He's not even mentioned. Here's the truth. Minus Gideon, they would have still beat the, the one against the Midian. Yeah, yeah. But hey, minus God, no way, Jose. <laughs> you know those odds, right? What, whenever we are victorious in life, whenever we overcome, maybe when we become proficient in what we do and comfortable and good, I mean, we'd better remember to give all the praise, the glory, and the credit to God. Amen. Just defer it to Him. Verse 23. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. He said, uh, Yahweh, the Lord, shall rule over you. So Gideon's response is both immediate and firm. And we say, good job, Gideon. I mean, you shouldn't, there's some things you don't need to pray about. Or don't even think about. And so he's very quick, he's very immediate, he's very firm. Gideon says the answer is no and no. And he seems to discern the underlying problem with their request. The men of Israel want to be ruled by a man rather than by God. After rejecting their offer, he reminds them that, you know, it's the Lord who rules over his people. We, we made that point at the beginning of this book. We're talking about various judges. But it's really the Lord who is the judge. Overall. And the same with the monarch. Yes, he had several kings, but God was the one who was the king. They don't need a king to obey. They need to obey the king that they have. Right? And it's just, it's just the way it is. And so everything that tempts us, everything that tempts us to compromise our values, everything that tempts us to compromise our faith or to inch out of the will of God is all present right here in this offer. It's a pretty heady offer, you know? First, there's a promotion, right? From judge to king. After all, I got a promotion, right? And that, that's quite a promotion. And with the kingship comes power. With the kingship comes prestige. With the kingship comes wealth and possessions. All that is wrapped up in being a king. And there's a great temptation for us to sell out uh, to the God of mammon and materialism. Come on. Jesus said it right there, right? Is it uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24? You, you know, uh, you, you can only serve one master. And he said, God and mammon. Isn't that interesting? But the Bible records the lives of people who compromise, sold out because of material wealth and things. Uh, we could talk about Achan. And we could talk about Lot, and we could talk about um, 
uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Remember Gehazi, you know, you know what, what, what Elisha wouldn't accept. He came back on the backside and said, I'll cut you a deal. Let me, uh, what about Demas? I mean, we could name both Old and New Testaments, all kinds of personalities that their heads were turned from God by such an offer. Gideon's initial response seems good enough, but then again, <laughs> what follows is disturbing. I flee from, you know, I often, people say, I often flee from temptation, but I leave my forwarding address. Well, that's what he's doing here. Verse 24, are you there? And Gideon said unto them, but now that we're talking about it, <laughs> I would love to desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Interesting. Technically, the Midianites were not Ishmaelites. They were descendants of Abraham and Keturah. The term Ish Ishmaelites is kind of used in a generic way to talk about nomadic tribes like the Midianites, like the children of the east, so to speak. And evidently, it was for nomadic people, people on the move, on the run. Uh, it was, you know, this was a common characteristic among those people to wear these gold earrings. And so having rejected the possession of a king, he comes in the back door and assumes the honor of a king. He requests the financial reward that is due a king. And by requesting that people give him gold earrings and from their share of spoils of war, it's kind of uh, putting them in debt, a gesture of submission to him. And so while he outright turns down the position, at the same time he, uh, he assumes some of the prerogatives of a king. Verse 25 and 26. And they answered, Sure, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand seven hundred shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment, royal raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were about their camels' necks. And so the men of Israel willingly willingly give up their spoils of war to Gideon and in doing so kind of acknowledge themselves as subjects or vassals to the new king. And the, the total weight of this hall, approximately 50 pounds. That's considerable. That's a considerable fortune. In addition to that, they throw in to the earrings, they throw in ornaments, collars, purple clothing, or royal clothes, Back then, I mean, you know, purple was only worn by royalty and such, and you know, um, as well as the chains around the necks of the camels. Now, get that in your head. Probably gold. Evidently, it was quite a haul that uh, they just said, "Here, here, Whew. man, what would you do if they gave you a million? What if, what did you do if you had? What if you won the?" Brother Ron, what if he had a member that won the... <laughs> uh, I take the devil's money, amen. Verse 27. <laughs> and Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even Ophrah. So an ephod. Now, we know what that is. That was worn by exclusively by the high priest in the tabernacle. And by the way, the tabernacle right now in this setting is in Shiloh. And so in front of the ephod, we know, was the uh, Urim and the Thummim, those two stones. That people don't know. They don't they cast them or one of them, they, one of them lit up, uh, you know, yes or no. But it was, a, it was a prominent thing that the high priest used at certain times of national crisis to discern uh, the will of God. And so making his own copy of an ephod, I, I want you to know that Gideon encroached upon the Aaronic priesthood. That, that's not his... God struck a king with leprosy once who did that. And, um, and so he's, he's really stepping across some lines here. Gideon... 
uh, perhaps Gideon wore that ephod as a priest uh, when, when he wished to inquire of the Lord. And so maybe just on special occasions, maybe he even performed sacrifices on an altar, kind of like the one he tore down in chapter 6, verse 25, in his dad's backyard, the offer to Baal. Perhaps he just assumed the role of it. Gideon establishes not only that, a rival place of worship by moving this ephod to his hometown of Ra. And so suddenly, all of Israel now was given a choice <laughs> to which church they wanted to go to, to a different place of worship. So now Gideon had undermined the, the theocratic unity of Israel. He's not helping here at all. Not only is he accumulating wealth, he's, 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 he's messing with God's stuff. Verse 27 continues, And all Israel, <laughs> well, you can count on this, went thither whoring after. That word whoring means to commit fornication. It speaks of a harlot, playing the harlot. They just went after it. That was just great. Man, they were quick to give him money. They were quick to offer him a promotion. They were quick to give him money. They were quick to accommodate him and, and go to his, to, to his place, new place of worship. People of Israel prostituting themselves, choosing to worship in Ophrah rather than in Shiloh. So many times in the Bible, apostasy over and over and over again in the Old and in the New Testament is spoken of in terms of adultery and fornication. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Lord said, Israel is my betrothed wife. In the New Testament, the Lord's church is called the bride of Christ. And so when, we, when, we, when we're unfaithful to God, it's compared in terms of adultery and fornications. Even James 4.4, 4, it says, ye adulterers, look at that, and adulteresses. Know ye not that friendship with the world is enemy with God. Whether therefore ye be a friend of the world is enemy of God. And so Jesus says that, you know, you can't have one master. You're going to be, you know, you are married to one. You can't have both, you know. So God and mammon. And so James identifies that with a problem with materialism. Verse 27 concludes, which thing became a snare. Look at this. A snare unto Gideon and to his house. Okay, we've talked about the implication of Israel. But even Gideon, especially Gideon, the choices he made uh, have, have a great, had a great impact. On his prodigy, on his house, that word snare, it speaks just what it is. You know, it's a noose to catch prey. You use the snare, you, it, 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 it's a fine art. I went trapping a lot with my father-in-law in the foothills of Colorado, and we caught everything from bobcat to whatever, but I was amazed at trapping and snaring and, and, and uh, all, all the art to that. But you, you catch a well-worn worn trail, you know, animals run trails just like we do every day. Same, same, head down, going to work, going to work, going to school, same road, you know. And they, they just catch them when they're not paying attention. And they get a real fine wire. And, and, and so next thing you know, the coyote's got his head through it. And then he pulls to get away and it's over. And that's what he's talking about. It was a snag. It was a snare. And you know, we, we, we ought to really pray about everything that God asks us to do. And I mean, you know, that every promotion, and those, there are things we really ought to pray about. And uh, so I, I think I fear leaving more than I fear staying. I mean, you could, I've seen people go from the fire to uh, the, the pan into the fire, you know, things get worse. So Gideon, Gideon's family, it became a snare. Gideon's father had been the caretaker of a Baal's altar in Ophrah, right? And, and so God told Gideon, you go tear that down. But guess what? Now Gideon is the caretaker of an object of worship 
in the same town, doing the same thing that his dad did. And, and, but he ends up leading Israel in the, in the opposite direction. I mean, a judge is supposed to, to redirect people back to God. And, and, uh, and, but here he is a judge, and he's creating confusion. The one who destroyed idols now creates them. There are cathedrals in Europe uh, that have been built for the offerings of worshipers who came to see relics. Catholic Church is big in relics. I mean, I, I, I read Metaxas' biography of Martin Luther, and it's quite a read. And uh, he talked about the relics that different new cathedrals advertise. You know, quarts of the Virgin Mary's milk, breast milk, on display. You say, what? Or the toe of, or the thumb of, the, you know. And by the way, those relics are still, probably some of those are in run. I mean, and people would come. It's like going to the state fair. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Many times we substitute the forms, the routines, and the symbols of worship rather than the invisible God himself. And we can be guilty of the same thing. We can have a form of faith and religion without the power. Just an empty shell. Come on. So, we, you know, it all becomes a routine. Verse 28 begins, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so they lifted up their heads no more. So the defeat of Midian was so severe, they never survived it. They never played a major role in biblical history. Verse 28, and the country was in quietness, or P had peace, for 40 years in the days of Gideon. So, you know, I'm, we, we're kind of hard on Gideon. Gideon did some good things, and no doubt, even wearing that ephod, and even though what he did, even though he, he kept the nation strong, uh, he wasn't a Mugabe, you know, <laughs> evidently he, uh, the, you know, there were no other invaders, or, and he kept the nation safe, and here we are celebrating 9-11, and praise God, we haven't had another one of those since then. And by the way, evil only knows one thing, and that's might. That's the reason Jesus will rule with a rod of iron You're in the millennial kingdom. So during Gideon's lifetime, there was peace in Israel. The problem was, it was peace at the expense of worship. True worship of God. It, it was peace at the expense of obedience to God. And we think about our own nation here. And, you know, and we can say, well, we got peace here. But how long will you have peace when you don't honor the God of the country? You know, of the, of the only one, the one who is the fount of all blessings. Verse 29, and Jerubbabel, the son of Joash, which is Gideon, went and dwelt in his own house, okay? And Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had, he had many wives. You remember uh, Deborah and her judgeship when she heard cases? She set up under a tree. I forget what kind it was. Probably a magnolia. Yeah, I don't know what it was. But she sat up under a tree, right? We're talking about the oaks of Mamre and things like that. So, we, so, so what does Gideon do here? He moves uh, his judgeship, uh, his base of judgeship, to his hometown, Ophrah. It's all there, all right? The ephod's there, altar's there, no doubt. His judgeship is there, and the multiplication of what wealth, the multiplication of wives, and now the multiplication of children is further evidence that Gideon is assuming the prerogatives of a king, or in, or and and maybe even a king priest, maybe even a king priest, and so it's not good. Verse thirty-one, and his concubine was in Shechem. She also bear him a son whose name was called Abimelech. So he's got all of these wives. And, and by the way, you go read Deuteronomy. Even way back uh, when Moses is talking 
uh, his, his last messages and stuff to, to, to the nation. And he brings it up about a king. And he says, not if, but when you have a king. Kings are not to do this. They're not to, get, to accumulate great wealth. They are not to accumulate, you know, concubine, wives, 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 harem, wives, concubine. They are not, 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 not. But what they're supposed to do is read the word of God every day. What they're supposed to do is to know me and know my word. That's what they're supposed to do. And you know what? Even though he's not technically a king, boy, I tell you what, he's filling the job description. He's claiming all the, all the prerogatives of a king he, and adding this concubine and having a child and naming the child Abimelech. The name Abimelech means my father is king, which is an ambitious name to give one of your own sons. Kind of a presumptuous name. Oh, yeah, we want to make you king, your son's king, and your son's son's king, right? That was original. No, and no, and well, let's name him. <laughs> let's name him a bit of like. This thing's working out okay. It became a snare to Gideon, and it became a snare to his family. Well, I'll tell you what, as a head of a home and decisions parents make, boy, you better think it through. Verse 32. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash's father in uh, Ophrah of the Abizrites. And so Gideon died, was buried uh, pretty much right where he was born. But he took quite a journey, you know. He went from poverty uh, to prosperity to corruption. Verse 33, And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made, uh, uh, and made Ber, uh, baal Bereth their god. Well, the name baal Bereth means covenant Baal, which indicates that they forfeit the covenants of God the God of Israel, to make or enter into a covenant with Baal. You know, and that's typical from the Old. I mean, that's a, from the Old to the New Testament, you know. No other gods before me. I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, right before the chapter when he's talking about the Lord's table and addressing issues in Corinth over how they observe the table. In the latter part of chapter 10, it just comes to my mind. He says, you cannot... You cannot eat at the table of devils and eat at the table of God at the same time. You know, you, you can't. And so here they're making a covenant. And we just talked the other night about the covenants of God. We talked about the eight covenants and the, the Davidic, I mean, the, especially the covenants from Abraham on to Israel and how we as Gentiles, right, were outside of those covenants and Christ has brought us near and now we, we enter into the covenants, right? They were all made, all made, even the new covenant, initially made to Israel. And then they're forfeiting it. They're forfeiting that. It's kind of like Esau selling his birthright for, for lentil soup, right? And, and so they enter into a covenant. They're already forsaking God. Israel once again, once again, and we've seen it and we will see it yet again. Uh, comes full circle. And that is the cycle of sin continues. And so when, when Gideon dies, well, then they go a whoring. That word is used again uh, after other gods. Verse 34. And the children of Israel remember not Jehovah their uh, uh, God their uh, Elohim, who had delivered them out of the hand of all their enemies on every side. And having already forsaken the designated place of worship in Shiloh and the sanctioned means of worship in the tabernacle and the Aaronic priesthood, priesthood, it's not long until they forget God altogether. So, been pastoring for a long time and... Uh, 
well, we're just going to take a break for a while. And we're just going to let go of this responsibility. And, you know, you, you see it over a period of time, then it's another service, and then it's another service, and then they're gone. And it's not even that they're, they've left this church and going attending faithful somewhere else. They're just not in church at all. And, you know, and Satan, these, these, this moving us from here to here, you know, and we see this whole process in the, in the flow of this chapter. We're starting out with a rebuttal. No, right? Absolutely not. Well, you know, and next thing you know, well, then he might as well have said yes. Because that's exactly, and even, even uh, assuming that his son, uh, you know, that would, would become king. And uh, we need to be careful about the decisions we make. We live in such a crazy society. Everybody's crazy busy, right? Crazy busy. And we're occupied and we're distracted. And it's just so easy, you know, and we, we it's so easy to get too much of one, uh, you know, not enough of God. We cut back here. Well, we, we can cut back. We cut always out of God's slice, Right? And, and, and not the world's. And, well, we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. We've got to be over here. We've got to be over there. Many of these things are not bad things. It's just the lesser things. And so we see that shift. Verse 35, Neither showed they uh, kindness to the house of Zerubbabel, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness that he had shown unto Israel. And so the Hebrew word kindness here is a is a is a is a Hebrew word that's often in the Old Testament, Hesed, and it talks about covenant love, loyal covenant, loyal love. You know, it carries the concept of a of a covenant loyalty, and so it says, you know, that when they when they cut off their covenant loyalty and they made a covenant with Baal. That they, they, their, their loyalty to Gideon also dried up. It was God who? Yahweh who? And it's like Gideon who? Well, what has he done for me lately? And so, we, they, they, you know, even they would, did not remember him. First they forgot the God, then they forgot Gideon. And it happened so quickly. Isn't it amazing how quickly God bleeds out of a culture? the knowledge of Christ out of a family. But isn't that the way it is with all of life? You know, it takes forever to lose that weight, but boy, you can have a lot of fun real quick and get it right back quick. And it's the same with bodybuilding or anything else. It's just, it's just the way this world is. And it's the same with it. It takes a lot of work to keep ourselves in the love of God. But I tell you what, we can let up and, and lose ground real quick. And so here we have it. We have Gideon and his last chapter of his life. Well, we're going to close with some lifetime lessons from Gideon's final chapter. Okay? There's only 17, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Number one, beware the trappings of success. We've got to start with that. And as Christians, everything we do, we need to understand. And Paul helps us to see this in both Colossians and in Ephesians but everything we do is an extension of our identity in Jesus Christ. Come on. Parenting, school, teacher, student, employee, employer, everything that we do is an extension of our identity in Jesus Christ. We all have different vocations. We all have different occupations. But in the end, we all work for the same boss. Well, I don't like my boss. Well, he's really not your boss because whether you like your boss down here or not, your boss is Christ. So you do your work to please Christ and it'll be okay. And that's hard to do sometimes. It's hard to do. But the trappings of success. And so everything, What the reason I'm saying that is everything is about Christ and not us. Everything. We must pursue excellence. But at the same time, we've got to learn to direct all the praise and the credit and the glory to God. 
So, you know, we say success is two homes, you know, or three homes or so many cars. We measure. We're Americans. That's how we measure success. But you can be very successful in that you're good at what you do. You've done it long enough and, you know, you're, and then that can become, you can be uh, reading your own press. If you know what I speak, and next thing you know, you're just like Gideon. Uh, we need to learn to defer praise. And just direct it, redirect it to God. Come on. And I think it's good to compliment people. And I think it's good to encourage people that they're doing a good job. Especially the local, whoever, you know, that person, you know, that's probably just been tongue lashed all day. And have one person show up and says, you know, you did that, you did a good job. You're a server, you're whatever. And I think that's a good thing. I'm not saying that we don't praise or encourage people. We need to do that. But at the same time, when we are encouraged to praise, we got to make sure we defer that to God. Because it could become a snare. Here's the second thing. Know your weaknesses, right? Gideon ended up falling prey to the same destructive uh, temptations that his father had. It wasn't an altar of bell, but it just well as well might have been. Same destructive patterns. Uh, of his father. So a lot of our temptations and a lot of our weaknesses are genetic. They're passed on. And so you got to know your vessel, Paul would say. Know yourself. Uh, there's a self-awareness. I mean, we, we have all of us have areas in our life that we are easily tempted and led astray. We also have blind spots of vulnerability that we don't detect, but someone can show us. And pray for us. David prayed this prayer in Psalm 39 verse 4. Lord make me to know mine end. In other words help me to understand who I am. And you know I'm just just dust. I'm just the creature that you created God. Help me to know who my end. And and, and the measure of my days. What it is. and and, And that I may know how frail I am. So that, that's a good thing to think about, about knowing who you are, knowing who God is. You know yourself and God that knows you even better. And, and to come to grips with your propensities and pray for His grace. Here's the thing, know your God. Know your God. In, in time Gideon and his family lost touch with the Lord God of Israel. Totally lost touch. I mean, when they're talking to Gideon there, they're not even mentioning God. Oh, you delivered us, right? I mean, what did God do? He says, you know, you started with uh, thousands, you know, and said, oh, get down to 300, and then I want you to go surround with, with, a, with a, sh- a shofar and a clay pot that's got a candle in it. And Come on, Gideon. It was God that did this, right? It was God that did this. But they forgot. They took their eyes off God. And they forgot about, A, his holy character. And they forgot about his faithful love. You know what God says? You hear him talking? Don't you know what? You forgot me. You, you forsake me. Don't you remember all the things that I've done for you? When you're a parent and your kid hurts you and they walk off, you're saying, well, oh. You know, and they're chasing some friend that's done nothing for them, you know? And here you've, you've labored and helped this child, and yet they just turn around, and not that that's happened to you. <laughs> that's how God feels. Jeremiah 9, I, I thought of this verse, I, these verses. I just had to read them. Jeremiah 9, 23. About knowing God, thus saith the Lord. This is from God himself. Let, let not the wise man glory in What? His wisdom, glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in what? His might. Not the rich man glory in what? There you go. There's the trappings. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands me and knows me. You can't do that and avoid the Bible. You can't do that and your Christianity consists of t-shirts and a coffee cup and logos. And those aren't bad things, but it's shallow. Know with me that I am Yahweh. We exercise. And by the way, Kesed, Kesed, loving kindness, justice, righteousness to the earth 
and those things I delight, saith the Lord. Don't you know me? This is what I like. This is what pleases me. And this is what I detest. And by the way, a proud look and a proud heart, I detest. But the, but, but the humble person, I love humility. I love it. And if you'll humble yourself before me, I'll lift you up. And I'll bless you. Don't you know me? Know your God. Here's the last admonition. Keep your faith. The phrase casual Christianity is an oxymoron. I've said it from this pulpit, and I'll say it again. Christianity is a thinking person's faith. It's not a, it's, it's not a faith of symbols. It's a faith of substance. You know, and what did they do? They went after the ephod. They went whoring after it. Oh, I felt so. Did you see that cathedral? Did you feel that? I love the fog machine around Brother Patty John. <laughs> he's on a cruise right now. And he's, his nose is itching. He has ears. He didn't know. <laughs> what am I talking about? Apathy, complacency, indifference, spiritual drowsiness, insensitivity. You can, you can blow this service off and you, you, know, you blow this lesson off and, you know, sure. And, and, but I tell you what, you're the loser for that. I really believe that. That's not Christianity. Christianity is leaning forward. Come on. Oh, you're quiet tonight. I'll say that again. Christianity is leaning forward. It's not row, row, you know, it's not floating merrily down the stream. It's floating up against the current. It just takes effort. That's the reason Proverbs says in verse, chapter 4, verse 23, keep your heart with what? All, get in what's your heart, what's your heart, what's your heart, keep your heart. And don't let that get, don't, don't, that's a trap, it's a snare. Keep your heart. Cast it down. Listen to that friend who comes up. You've got a blind spot. And you know what you said and did. And listen to him rather than be mad at him. So in Proverbs, it says, keep your heart. But then in Jude, chapter 2, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. There's something for us to, yes, we're saved by grace. Yes, it is the free gift of God. But there is something left for us to do. And we got a whole generation of lazy, 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 lazy Christians. And you know what? Christianity, by and large, is serving it up where, you know, it's convenient. You get your news 24, you, I mean, you, it, it, it's, it, it, they can make it easy. Now, a lot of church says, less, 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 less. Tastes good, less filling. <laughs> make it fun. But over 20 minutes? Come on. Keep your heart and your faith. I think that's the challenge of the Christian life, don't you think? And we have the life, the final chapter of Gideon's life. Good man. By the way, read Hebrews 11. He's there. He's there. Don't we have a gracious God? If any of his life, what does God do? He remembers the good, pushes away the bad. And that's a blessing. You know, I look at uh, Hebrews 11 as a eulogy by a gracious God. Come on. You know, we read some of those names over there in chapter 11. Say, you got him and her? She got her in there? You got him in there? Well, you didn't say anything about her, you know. But God's going to write your eulogy one of these days. Yeah. You want some white out. Put on the computer screen. God is gracious and he's merciful and he's forgiving. Come on. And he's the God of the second and third and fourth and fifth chance. And it's a good thing he has covenant, faithful love to us. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We, these uh, Old Testament and New Testament stories but are, are preserved by your Holy Spirit for us because they're so profitable. 
and, and, and yes, Eastern versus West and 21st century versus thousands of years before Christ. And yet, the heart is still the heart. People are still people. Temptations are pretty much the same. And so it's so good to be reminded of people's successes and yes, even their failures. And may we take heed lest we fall. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing. Living.